Glad that you're here this Sunday evening. Stand if you will. We're going to begin by singing that hymn together, Redeemed, How I Love to Proclaim It. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed. His child and forever I am. I know I shall see in His beauty the King in whose law I delight. Who lovingly guards my footsteps and give me a song in the night. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. Amen. If our ushers would come forward, we'll prepare to take up our Sunday night tithes and offerings. Let's ask God's blessing on our offering this evening. Heavenly Father, we love you and thank you for another opportunity you've given us to gather as a church family. We pray that you bless the study of your word this evening, bless the songs, the fellowship time we have together, and also this offering. Lord, may it be used to carry on your work both here and abroad. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can sit down. I was about to say you can remain standing, but you can, you can sit down. We're going to sing uh, another familiar old hymn, My Savior's Love. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned. Thanks for singing along with me this evening. We're going to be in the book of 1 Timothy tonight. 1 Timothy. We're going to be looking at chapter 1, and then we're also going to be in a bit of chapter 2. Hope you had a good afternoon. Hope you got a good nap, maybe. A few of you did. Amen. A good lunch. Some say, no, I didn't get a chance for a nap. When I got here this evening, I got something new, a nice gift that I was quite excited to have. So... These are Super Mario themed socks. 12 pairs of socks, Super Mario themed. Addie Hutchinson got them for me on Black Friday and, uh, and handed them to me tonight and I am just quite thrilled. I told her I have one pair of Super Mario socks and it's one of my favorite pairs. And so now I've got a dozen more. Uh, so I'm just gonna wear Super Mario socks all of the time. That's actually my cell phone ring uh, tone is the old Super Mario um old super mario game so i know uh, as a matter of fact i even have it i found it on the piano the music on the piano and i've got it printed up in a binder in my office and every once in a while i'll just pull it out and for fun i'll just play the super mario song on the piano have a good time so uh anyway that that uh, that made my evening so i'll be enjoying wearing those this week and through the holidays first uh timothy is where we are this evening, 1 Timothy chapter 1. We're going to read just a couple of passages out of chapter 1 before we get into this evening's message. 
Tonight's message, I think, and at least in my mind, you may disagree by the time it's over with, but I believe that tonight's message fits really well with what we were talking about this morning. Don't, if you weren't here, if you don't remember, uh, we talked about the, if, if you fake it, you won't make it, right? And how we are to be honest with God, be honest with ourselves, be honest with others and the importance of that. And so tonight we're talking about that same idea, that same theme of the truth, but from a little different angle. So look with me at the first four verses of 1 Timothy chapter 1. The Bible says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. Now skip down with me to verses 18 and 19 of 1 Timothy 1. Paul continues, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. So as Paul begins his letter, he's charging the reader. Now we have to remember this letter was written to an individual. This letter was written to Timothy, who was... Paul's protege, if you will, his son in the Lord. But this letter is included in the canon of Scripture, which means it wasn't just for Timothy, was it? It's for you and I. So as Paul is writing here to this particular individual, Timothy, we can sort of assert or or, or insert, if you will, ourselves into Timothy's seat in a sense, because this is for you and I as well. So how does this apply to you and I? What can we take from 1 Timothy that Paul is talking about here and use in our own Christian life? He gives Timothy some responsibility. And those responsibilities were Timothy's then and they're yours and mine now. He sums up the charge in verses 18 and 19 where he says to war a good warfare or fight a good fight. And what was Timothy supposed to be fighting for? And what sort of war was Timothy supposed to be engaged in? Well, it's the same type of fight and the same type of war that we see regularly addressed in the New Testament epistles. We understand, I've mentioned this before, but just by way of introduction to kind of refresh your memory on this, oftentimes the New Testament epistles were written primarily with an idea for trying to correct false doctrine. Think back with me, if you will, to the first century. Faith in Christ has become or is becoming somewhat popular. It's starting to get some amount of traction, even though it's looked down upon by most. It is becoming more and more commonplace. And so as that takes place, there are individuals who are not true followers of Christ that want to take advantage of that. They want to begin to add their own sorts of doctrines to what faith in Christ and the teachings of Christ were really all about. And so they can get the preeminence and they can get the notoriety and they can get the following and the power that goes along with that in their minds. So Paul, many of the New Testament epistles he wrote, he's trying to combat that. And here he's encouraging and admonishing Timothy to do the same thing. If you're going to fight a fight, the most important fight that you should war or wage is to fight for the truth. And we see the same thing in our culture today. We live in what's called, what's been called a post-modern culture. The idea of being post-modern is that many philosophers today and philosophy students believe that it is impossible to know objective truth. You can't know something that is universally, objectively true. In other words, something that's true without any way to argue it, 
without any way to, 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 to disagree. This is objectively a standard for truth for everyone, everywhere, all time. Postmoderns say that does not really exist. We have come to an understanding and evolution in human understanding, <coughs> excuse me, where we now know that's not possible. And many folks today want to, to promote that idea that you can't really know what is true. We hear so many individuals today talk about my truth and your truth. Now, one of the things that I do think that postmodern thought has brought to us in way of a benefit is for us to be able to appreciate the way that other people look at the facts and look at the truth. That your upbringing, your, the culture that you were raised in, uh, that has an impact and an influence on the way that you look at the truth. And that, that's just, that, that we can't dispute that. that. That's definitely what happens. People look at, and so we can look at the same thing and see it from different angles, if you will. See it from different aspects. Some of you probably remember at one point not too long ago on social media, there was a picture of a dress. Is this dress, I don't remember what colors that they wanted to debate it was. Is it blue or is it black or is it gold or purple? I don't know. But supposedly there was a group of people that when they looked at this dress, it looked one particular color. And then there was another group of people that when they looked at the dress, it looked like another particular color. And my thinking is, let's just throw the dress away and stop debating. You know, who really cares, right? But the point is basically the same. That we all can look at the same thing and we can see it from different angles, different aspects. We may appreciate it differently than others. The same can be said for the truth of God's Word. And I'll give you an illustration. I did not appreciate the passages of Scripture that refer to God as Father as much as I do now that I've had children of my own. I would imagine most of you that have children, have raised children, would probably say the same thing. As I read and studied my Bible after having had children of my own, those analogies of God like a parent mean more to me now. Psalm 103, I think it was just last Sunday night, we kind of walked through that passage of Scripture. One of, the, one of the verses there, like as a father pitieth his children, so God loves those that fear him. And that passage means more to me now as a dad than it did before I had children. So that's a means by which a different angle of looking at the truth. But let me ask you this, does that change the truth of that passage in any way? No. Does it change it? And so what Paul is telling Timothy here is that you are, and he's telling us by extension, you are to fight for the truth. We should be standing on the universally objective truth of God's word. And in the culture that we live in, when we live by this sort of truth, it's going to take, people are going to take notice. Because not everybody thinks this way anymore. It's not as popular and as in vogue as it was many years ago. I can barely remember, some of you would remember a little better than me, barely remember the Reagan administration. Some of you may remember it well. I was a child. I was two when Reagan was first uh, uh, in inaugurated and elected to uh, the United States presidency. And and so uh, for those eight years, I can vaguely remember a little bit of it. I've done a little study of that time period. And uh, one of the things that was huge in getting Reagan elected, this is crazy to think now, was what was called the moral majority. Jerry Falwell was the chairman of what's called the moral majority. As a matter of fact, in the late 70s, leading up in the early 80s, another big figure in that movement was Jim Baker. 
Jim Baker was a big deal then. As a matter of fact, you can go back on YouTube and see some interviews where Reagan does with Baker before he gets elected president, and he's wanting Baker's support. He's really trying to court Jim Baker. It's funny to think now, as we, we know all that's happened, that seems strange to us now, but, but they called it the moral majority. And that group sort of became under Falwell and, and people like Jim Baker who had such following of, of somewhat evangelical Christians, it became a huge force. They mobilized this group to, to basically elect uh, Reagan and some other conservative politicians into national offices. And, and we can, can talk about that. I'm not here to talk about politics, of course. But, but that, that was a thing then, you know, the, the moral majority. There are some that would say that there is still a moral majority in the United States today. And that much as it was in the late 70s going into the early 80s, it is dormant. It's sort of asleep. And, and I think that may be the case, but I'll be honest with you. As we look at our political landscape today and how things have fallen out and gotten us to where we are right now, I kind of wonder, where's the moral majority going? If they are there and if they do care, it's kind of hard to tell in the way that elections have gone as of late. And again, I'm not here to preach politics. Uh, that's not my point. But my point is, there are many today here in America that don't seem to be very, very interested in truth. Many that aren't very interested in truth. They're interested in what's convenient. They're interested in what will affect their bank account, their bottom dollar. But as far as truth is concerned, that can come or go. And the Bible teaches us here in 1 Timothy that our primary concern should not be what's convenient. Our primary concern should not be what is best for our bank account, but our primary concern should be the truth, and primarily, specifically, the truth of God's Word. So we're going to ask this question tonight as we look at 1 Timothy 1 and part of chapter 2 as well. How can I effectively fight for truth as a Christian in today's culture? How can I effectively fight for truth as a Christian in today's culture? culture. We're going to look at three answers from this passage of scripture. Number one, by a commitment to right doctrine. By a commitment to right doctrine. True love is willing to correct. By a commitment to right doctrine. True love is willing to correct. Look again at verse 3 of chapter 1. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions, rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. Paul here is reminding Timothy of a particular responsibility he had. As pastor of those people, he had to make sure the doctrine was right. He had to keep the doctrine orthodox, if you will. He had to make sure that he was teaching the truth of Christ's life, ministry, and teachings. And that those that he may come into contact with who were teaching others as well, that they were doing the same. Don't teach fables and endless genealogies. And, and that idea doesn't mean very much to us today, but then it would have. Genealogies were a big, big deal to Jewish people at that time. And so the idea of tracing the genealogy of Christ, tracing the genealogy of other prophets, tracing the genealogy of other preachers, that was a big deal. He says, don't worry with that sort of stuff. You need to be concerned about the right Doctrine. He goes on in his second letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But sadly today, the average American individual is willing to simply accept truth just by taking someone else's word for it. Yeah. My son and I were talking about this recently. It is interesting how much of what we tend to regard as truth we accept 
on the basis of what's called authority. And authority just means you believe the source that gave you the information. Uh, we hear people talk about statistics, and uh, you'll hear somebody say something about her. Just, just the other day, we were talking about something. I, I can't remember what it was specifically. And this individual, they just knew the, the right answer, and they just spoke it with authority. And it was, it was kind of in a group of individuals. I didn't want to call this young man out, but I, I Googled it later, and he had no idea what he was talking about. But he was convinced, and he was determined that he was going to convince somebody, and it wasn't about anything important. But he was going to convince them too. And if someone sounds authoritative, often we're tempted to just take their word for it. Just get, hey, they're the expert. You ever taken your car to a, a mechanic? Something was wrong and you didn't know what it was. Maybe some of you have some mechanical uh, uh, ability. Uh, brother uh, uh, Tanel back there, yeah, he takes a car to a mechanic and if the mechanic tells him the wrong thing, he, he may have a good idea that the guy's pulling his leg. I have no idea, you know. I may bring the car in and the headlights won't come on and they tell me it's something to do with the rear end. Well, I, I don't know. I have no idea what they're talking about. So we just accept what they have to say as the truth based on authority. Well, they're a mechanic. I'm in a mechanic shop. They're working on my vehicle. I'm just going to accept what they say is true. Now, is it possible for a mechanic to be wrong? Not very often, Brother Robert, not very often. But I'm assuming it does happen occasionally. We may have all had instances, or some of you instances, where you took a vehicle in, they said it was one thing, and it turned out it wasn't that thing. I've had that happen before. Not when Robert was working on anything, but you know, other places. It had that happened before. So those authorities can sometimes be wrong. Maybe even a doctor. Go to a doctor, and the doctor says this is what's wrong. It turns out they didn't get it right. They didn't know what they were talking about. It's one thing to believe, based on authority, what a mechanic says about my vehicle, or even what a doctor may say about my body and my health. But when we're talking about matters that have to do with my never dying soul and eternity, boy, I don't need to just leave that up to chance. I don't need to just take someone's word for it because they sound good. And I've said this before and I'll say it again. I'm, I'm sure if the Lord allows me to live and speak much longer, don't take my word for what you hear about God's word. If something doesn't sound right, if something doesn't match up in your mind, you write it down and go home and study. Study it for yourself. We need to make sure that we know. And by the way, I do. I study. I try to make sure that what I'm saying is in line with what God's Word has to say and what other faithful scholars of God's Word have studied for years and years and years. But that doesn't mean that I'm not in, uh, uh, capable of, of, of communicating some sort of error. We need to make sure that we are standing for the truth. Don't just accept something because you hear it from someone that sounds authoritative. We can't treat spiritual matters like we do car trouble or health issues. I can remember, um, it's been a few years ago now, an individual gave me a book. It was a Bible study book, and it was based on it was like a, a a bible study through the entire year and each day of the year was based on a different greek word and i don't know much about greek and i guess the individual gave it to me because they assumed i may have some interest in it but i can remember getting to a particular word i'm just perusing the book i'm just kind of scanning it and, and i happen on a couple of three different words that strike my attention and as i'm reading what this man a supposed expert in the greek language is writing and communicating i realize that that's not matching up with some of the study that i've done and so I go back, and it turns out this man had no idea what he was talking about. As a matter of fact, the truth is, it was connected back to word of faith theology, which was a twisting of the Greek word. And so we have to be mindful, we have to be careful of what we're receiving, what we're reading, what we're hearing, whether it's from this platform or from the radio, even those that we may consider faithful preachers and teachers, we've got to keep our 
our, our ears turned on. <laughs> We've got to be paying attention to what it is that we're receiving from God's Word. It's one of the ways that we stand for the truth. We should be interested in knowing the truth. So we're talking about the idea of true love being willing to correct and correction should always be connected to love. Verses 5 and 6, now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned, from which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling. Uh, that's a King James Version word that we don't use anymore. That idea of vain jangling basically means empty talk or idle discussion. Things that really aren't helping or, 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 or benefiting anybody. It's just this idea of talking for talk's sake. So Paul here is encouraging Timothy to deal with manners of doctrine, but to deal with manners of doctrine in a spirit of love. Have you ever noticed other people, and you see that they are, they're maybe they wrong about something? Anybody ever notice, you don't have to raise your hand, just want you to think about it rhetorically for a moment. You know that this individual, you heard them talk about something, or, or you, know, you understand they're making a decision, upcoming decision, and, and you, know, you know that they're wrong. Think about that. For probably most of us have encountered, those of us who are old enough anyway, we, we've encountered a bit of that. We, we know that maybe somebody else is, they're, they're just mistaken. Maybe, they, maybe they're just ignorant. Maybe they, they don't realize what they're doing, but, but they're wrong. Those sorts of situations can be very difficult to deal with, can't they? When you, when you know someone is wrong and, and you know that, you know what, I, I should go to them, I should say something, I should try to help them, and, and not in a spirit of condemnation, but you know they're, they're going to make a mistake. They're going to do something that they don't need to do here. They're going to regret this decision, and I need to go and help. It's difficult oftentimes to do that because people have a hard time receiving it, don't we? kind of touched on this just a little bit this morning, but the idea of being corrected, even if the other person is right, still doesn't mean it doesn't sting, does it? Oh man, absolutely. And I, you know, I, I can say this because my wife's not in here tonight, but um, don't tell her I said it. I'll call you a liar. But she knows I tend to lie, so she'll believe you. Um, when my wife corrects me, man, it stings. It just stings. And I know oftentimes, not all the time, but oftentimes she's trying to help. Not always. No, I'm kidding. She, she, it stings, though. I, and I'll readily admit I've said this to her. I've said it in her presence. I've said it outside her presence. My wife is smarter than I am. Steve Dane, don't amen that. Don't amen that. My wife is smart. Right, put, just put that thing over your head, brother. Uh, my wife is smarter than I am. I, I know that. It's very clear. Her mind operates on a level. Her brain functions at a level that I just can't quite get to. And so I appreciate her help. I really do. My wife is a help me. She helps me in more ways than I could even take the time to tell you. But when she corrects me, oh, it just bothers me. It, it, it stings. I know no one else in here feels that way, right, when your spouse corrects you in any way. My wife has no idea what it feels like because I never get to correct her, you know. But, but boy, that, that can be tough. It can be tough to receive correction from someone else. But let me ask you this. If you're really wrong, don't you want to know? I mean, there have been times that I've gone to my wife on Sunday morning before I leave. I tend to now, I, I leave earlier than her. And gone to my wife after I've put my coat and tie and, and, and my shirt all, you know, got that all together and go and check with my wife, and there's been a time or two that she's kind of smirked at me, you know, or maybe chuckled just a bit, because she looked at me and thought, well, that's just too funny not to laugh, you know, and she'll tell me, no, you got to fix that, and I, hey, I am glad to know, I am, I don't want to come here and look like an idiot in front of everybody any more than I already do, if I can help it. Well, that doesn't mean that it doesn't, mm, it just stings, just, it, just, it just bites just a, a little bit. 
when Paul here is talking to Timothy, he's encouraging Timothy to correct, but to correct in love. There's a right way to correct people. There's a right way to approach someone when they're wrong. Do it in humility. Do it in love. I can remember a coach, a basketball coach in high school. I was going from ninth grade to 10th grade. I was making the transition. I'd started on JV. I actually had, I know some people say that guys, you know, they, they make, I was a starter on the JV team in high school. I was also really involved in music, piano, vocal things for a big uh, competition that we did every year, a fine arts competition. And I can remember, I, just, I, told him, I told him the story he'd forgotten. I told him the story this summer. I saw him at the National Association of Free Will Baptist Convention this summer. Jeff Stocks, he pulled me aside in between my freshman and sophomore years of high school. He said, Zach, I hear that you're going out for the, for the varsity team. I said, Mr. Stocks, yeah, I sure am. I'm excited about the next school year, basketball season. He said, listen, you and I both know that you have some talents God's given you. And we both know where your talents lie. And I think that you need to lay down the, either of these things, this music or ball, that you're not as good at as the other. He said it really nicely, but he basically said, listen, don't waste your time trying out for the varsity basketball team. And he told me, he said, you'll make the team. He said, I know what your skill level is. I'm the one who will make the cuts. You'll make the team, but you'll ride the pine and you'll spend all this time practicing basketball when you could be spending some of that time practicing your piano and your singing and your musical stuff. And at the time, man, that hurt. Oh, man, as a 16-year-old young man, especially it was a small Christian school, much like Cornerstone Christian Academy is here, basketball was the sport. It was it. And the idea of not being a part of that group, man, that was painful for me. But it was what I needed to hear. Because I have, I mean, it's the tr I have absolutely no skill when it comes to anything sports-related. I, I, and have, having spent two or three more years of you know, hours every day trying to, to, to get better at something that I was just not any good at, why waste the time? He helped me clarify a little bit of my future. Zach, you, you never go into the NBA, pal. You're not even playing, to, uh, the Tar Heels are never calling. You know what I mean? Just hang up the sneakers and go get on the piano. You know, do the best you can with that. And I'm so glad that he did. So there are times that it's appropriate for us to correct. There are times that it's appropriate for us to go and talk to others and deal with maybe some things that we see that they don't see as readily, but we need to be mindful that we do it in love. We do it with compassion. How can I effectively fight for truth as a Christian in the day's culture by a commitment to the right doctrine and by living in faithfulness to the gospel message and the glory of God? By living in faithfulness to the gospel message and the glory of God. This faithfulness is motivated by a consistent realization that it's all about him and never about you. I'm working right now on what we're going to be, a series we're going to start through the book of Colossians next year. And that book, the book of Colossians, is all about the supremacy of Christ and how Jesus is supreme above everything he is the one that has the preeminence and he's the only one that should have the preeminence and and that that was written by paul as well and he touches on this very idea here verse 12 first timothy 1 and i thank christ jesus our lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful putting me into the ministry who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious but i obtained mercy because i digged it ignorantly in unbelief and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to everlasting life. Now unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul's nearing the end of his life as he writes this letter to Timothy. 
And God had used him to spread the gospel throughout much of the known world at that time. But even here, you don't see Paul patting himself on the back. He doesn't take the credit for what God has done in his life. Even as an older man, nearing the end of his life, he's still pointing to Jesus. I mean, think about this letter that Paul is writing. This letter is addressed to Timothy. We don't know for sure. We can speculate. But I would speculate that perhaps Paul just thought that Timothy would be the only one to ever read this. We don't know. And as he's writing to Timothy, I mean, Timothy's his son in the Lord. If there's anyone who probably at this time would have had a great deal of affection and respect for all that Paul had accomplished, it was probably Timothy. And Paul could have taken this time to reflect on all that he had accomplished for the cause of Christ. But that's not the way Paul puts it. Paul is still giving the credit and the glory and the honor to the only one who deserves it, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we have a Wednesday um, group of men who get together and, and we eat breakfast at 10 a.m. on Wednesdays. And we've been going to the Apple Barrel for a, a few weeks here now. And uh, if you got if any of you men that are available 10 a.m. this coming Wednesday, we'll be at the Apple Barrel. We'll be eating breakfast together. One of the individuals that comes every week is Jerry Barron. Just this past Wednesday, we were talking about some of the things uh, and we were asking questions, and he talked about some of the stuff that he went through in, was it 40 years you spent in Mexico? 45. I, I knew that 40 was not, not enough. 45 years, he and his wife were in Mexico trying to share the gospel. And he'll just tell stories, and, and man, and no, you all know Jerry. You know Jerry's not trying to toot any sort of horn on his, on his, for himself. But he would talk about some of the things that they went through. And I can remember uh, David, just this past Wednesday, he told three or four stories. And I said, Jerry, if any one of those three or four things had happened to me, I'm coming home. I ain't staying down there. Somebody else is going to have to go to Mexico. And he's talking about going down, way down into the southern part of Mexico, into these mud hut villages and, and some of the things that they dealt with, uh, going to take a shower, just kind of this makeshift shower, and a boa constrictor fall on you when you're trying to take a shower. I'm coming home. Randy, I'm coming home, brother. As a matter of fact, I think I'd be going home. You know what I mean? Wasn't it uh, 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 Fred Sanford? Elizabeth, Elizabeth. Boy, I'd have been out of here, man. Oh, my goodness. And some of the other things that, that he's been through, and I, it crosses my mind regularly when I sit across from him at uh, breakfast on Wednesdays, that, man, this is, this is a man akin to like the Apostle Paul in a lot of ways. And, and yet you get the same sort of attitude from Jerry, same sort of attitude. As a matter of fact, he's wishing I'd shut up right now and get on to something else. Because it's nothing about him. It's all about Jesus. And, and that's what our life should be about, right? That's what people should be thinking of and who they should be drawn to as we live our lives for the truth. Faithful to the truth. How can I live effectively or how can I effectively fight for the truth as a Christian in today's culture? Number one, a commitment to the right doctrine. Number two, faithful living to the gospel message and the glory of God. Number three, and this is going to be the last point, by agreeing with God in prayer. By agreeing with God in prayer. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Four different words Paul uses here to refer to prayer. Supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks. What does he mean by these? Supplication indicates a special urgent need, something that is time-bound, something that I need help with and God's intervention quickly, soon. Prayer is a more regular daily need. Intercession are needs presented on behalf of others. And giving of thanks is, of course, an expression of gratitude. He says these sorts of prayers are to be offered for all men. 
He goes on to express just how far-reaching this idea is. He says, even for those in authority, even for kings and those who rule over us, we are to be praying for every one. God expected them to offer the service of prayers to other people. So how do you serve others through prayer? It's easy to say, I'm praying for you, brother, praying for you, sister. It's another thing to write that need down, to write that prayer down, and to be bringing it up before the Lord regularly in prayer. Chris mentioned today as he was up here testifying to God's goodness and his help through this surgery this past week about how he could feel the prayers of other people. I do believe there's something to that. I'm not trying to be mystical about praying, but I do believe there's something to knowing that you have fellow believers in Christ who are lifting you up in prayer, that are concerned for your well-being, and that are praying faithfully for God to intervene on your behalf. There's something special about that. There's something that builds up my faith. There's something that affirms my own faith in Christ as I know there are other Christ followers praying for me. I commented to Chris after it was over with. I said, I so appreciate your willingness to come up and give a word of testimony. I think that's a way of encouraging the body, our brothers and sisters in Christ. Hey, here's how God met a need in my life. Prayer works. That's something that we need to hear from more people than just our pastor. Amen? We need to hear it from our brothers and sisters in Christ. We lift one another up in prayer. It's the greatest way that we can serve one another. It's genuine, consistent prayer on one another's behalf. Just this morning, I started back over. Sunday morning is when I start the beginning of my prayer list. And I work through Sunday back through Saturday. I finish it up. I was looking down through the different notes I've written this year. I gave everyone a a prayer list at the beginning of this year. I plan on having an updated prayer list to give out this coming year as we start in 2024. I think that's one of the greatest ways we as brothers and sisters in Christ can serve one another. I'll be honest with you, as your pastor, I believe it's one of the greatest ways that God has equipped me to be able to serve you. I call each of your names out in prayer. Ask God to move on your behalf and meet needs that you are experiencing in your own lives. Lift each other up in prayer. Praying supports God's work in this world and the next. 2 Timothy 2 verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So what Paul is saying here is that as I pray for others in the here and now, I lift them up in prayer, I serve them through the power of prayer, that that doesn't just have an effect on what's going on in their lives in the here and now, but it may impact their very souls in eternity. My praying supports God's work in this world and in the next. So tonight we've asked the question, how can I effectively fight for truth as a Christian in today's culture? We learn three answers to that question. A commitment to right doctrine, faithful living to the gospel message and the glory of God, and agreeing with God in prayer. See, most of us aren't going to have a great political platform to stand and talk to thousands about our views and to stand for the truth. But as we do it faithfully in these little ways, it makes a cumulative impact in our families, in our church, in our communities, our country, and the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of knowing the truth of your word. Lord, that is a privilege. You never obligated yourself to give us specifically as individuals, the truth of the Word of God. There are people in this world, what a humbling thought, people in this world right now who do not have access to read and study your Word the way that we do. We are truly blessed people. And God, we pray as we enjoy that blessing that we'll also appreciate and be serious about the responsibility that comes with it. Not just a blessing to be able to have access 
to the truth of your word, but it is also a responsibility to understand it and know it accurately and to stand for it as your truth, even in a culture that doesn't believe in truth anymore. Lord, we love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for coming this evening. I do have a prayer request that I want to mention to you guys tonight. Um, Deanne Brown contacted me this afternoon, not long before church. Told her I'd touch base with her again after church was over with. Many of you are aware that Sister Debbie has been pretty sick. Of course, David had some stents put in last week, and the last I have heard was doing pretty well from that, recovering from that. But Sister Debbie has been taken to St. Francis. Uh, she is, they believe, in heart failure. Uh, we don't know to what degree. Of course, those of you that are familiar with that idea know the various stages of heart failure, and it can be different levels of you know, seriousness. But, but still, regardless of, of what level this may be, we know that this is very serious. So uh, remember, Debbie, in your prayers tonight uh, as you dismiss that the Lord would touch her and touch her body and give her a healing. That's all I know right now. Deanne seemed to be in a bit of a hurry, of course, to get to her mother, to be there to support her. So I told her I'd touch base with her later on this evening after service was over with. So remember Debbie in prayer, if you will. All right? All right. You are dismissed. Have a wonderful rest of your evening.